Live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's The Q, covering Red Hat Summit 2017, brought to you by Red Hat. Hi, tonight I'm joined by my co-host, Stu Miniman. Stu, this is the day one of the conference, 20 keynotes, six general sessions, people from 70 countries gathered here in Boston, Massachusetts. You are a Red Hat Summit veteran. Thoughts, impressions of the first day? What, what has struck you, really? Yeah, so first of all, it's, like Red Hat itself, the company just keeps growing. It's just one of those, you know, strong progress. Uh, we talked a little bit about the intro this morning with Dave Vellante as, you know, what's it, 60 quarters consecutively that the company has had revenue growth. It's like, I worked that's, for yeah, a that, lot of tech companies. It's like, I remember amazing. I worked for Lucent yeah. when they were doing it, and up oh, they have a miss, and the stock kind of drops. Partic IBM, you know, has had quarter and quarter and things like this, but with all of these waves, and look, Red Hat's not the biggest company out there, but, they are an important player in many changes in the ecosystem. Uh, this is one of my favorite developer shows uh, that we cover at the, sh at the show. Of course, open source, uh, we used to say okay, software is eating the world and open source is eating software. Red Hat's right in the middle of this. Uh, I, I think most people agree, there really is only one Red Hat. There's not going to be a Red Hat of something else. There's no one else that has really captured that. They got involved at a certain point in time where they could have that model, but they've extended it. Uh, they understand what they're doing. They're getting involved in a lot of uh, a lot of interesting technologies. And there's you know a lot of people, like most conferences that we go to, is there's a lot of passionate people that are really interested, very tech savvy uh, group here, uh, going into all of these breakouts. You know, many came yesterday for some things. They're coming for a whole week to just dig in, do demos. Uh, down on the show floor, they've got like little coding challenges and VR things. Uh, I mean, there's just a lot of pieces of the show, uh, and you know, we, we only get to see a part of it, but I've, I've enjoyed the customers, the executives, and only one day of three that we're going to be covering so far. It is, it is early days in the summit, but where would you say that we are in terms of, of the maturity of the cloud? We heard from uh, Jim Whitehurst, the CEO, he's going to be on the program tomorrow. He talked about how uh, cloud strategy really is the number one thing on customers' mind. The cloud is not new, and, and we, we are really evolving and it is maturing. Where, where are we? Yeah, so, right, a couple of stats from the keynote this morning. It was 84% of customers have a cloud strategy. Now, those of us in the analyst world, we might say, well, let's see whether they really have a strategy they understand, and 59% have a multi cloud environment, which doesn't surprise us. Uh, most people, you know, the joke we used to have was uh, you had two types of customers, those that were using Amazon and those that didn't realize that some group was <laughs> using Amazon. Uh, reminds me of a comment I made earlier about like Linux itself. Um, there was always, you know, 15 years ago, you know, big companies would be like, oh no, well, you know, we're a Unix shop or we're looking at Windows and like, no, 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 there's the guy in the corner. He's been using Linux for a while yeah, and yeah. That, that, that's been a big driver. So cloud absolutely is maturing. Uh, I love it was an interesting discussion uh, we had with Paul Cormier towards the end of the day, we were Sam Ramji uh, from, from Google, uh, talking about how we've got the infrastructure and we've got the applications, and I'm an infrastructure guy, but I knew from you know day one, when the reason you build infrastructures is because of your application. Um, if I can just buy SaaS, I don't care about the infrastructure underneath it. The SaaS provider sure does. We talked to lots of SaaS providers as to how they're building their solution. If I'm using infrastructure as a service, you know, there's some I need to understand the infrastructure, and there's plenty of infrastructure here. Everything from there's the storage and networking teams, open source is permeating, you know, every corner of, of the environment. So um, it's maturing, but in many ways it's gotten more complex. Cloud was supposed to, we many of us thought, simplify the environment, but boy, it seems that many of the things that we had had in previous waves, as it gets more mature, it gets a little bit more complex. Red Hat tries to take those pieces together, uh, build them in into solutions. Uh, we've talked about, uh, you know, there's Red Hat Linux, you know, Enterprise Linux is the platform that can live in many environments. OpenShift is something that allows us to encapsulate all of those services, uh, things like containers. Uh, you know, we're working with our, uh, you know, cloud native applications uh, and, and what, how I want to build them, uh, OpenShift's going to help, uh, and, you know, Kubernetes uh, goes into the mix. So, uh, you know, Red Hat is, you know, places, you know, strategic bets, and uh, you know has a, has a strong position in a number of place, and has you know big partners. It's it, it's really interesting to see. You know, we've had a couple on already, and we'll have many on through the week uh, from you know key providers uh, in the infrastructure and cloud uh, pr players out there. 
I think the, the, the theme of this year's conference is uh, the power of the individual, and it really is. I mean, we heard from Sam Ramji who said, this is the age of the developer. Developers have more respect, more, more veneration than ever before, and yet we also heard from Sandra Rivera, it is also harder than it has ever been before to be a developer because there is just so much data, uh, and, it, and it's hard to know the difference between the good data and the bad data and where where you where you find the right insights to make decisions that drive the business on that data and if you're a developer you might not have the business savvy to do that so it, it's a real balance here that we're that that the companies and developers themselves are trying to strike are they doing a good job? I mean, is, is it too still too early? It, 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 it's funny, when, when you say that, it makes me think of, uh, in, in the machine learning space, it's how do we get the data to train the machine to understand what is good or not? And you know, I wish they'd done that for us when we all went to college. I know, because, it would have made so much, know, so much easier. In my job, it's always <laughs> like, okay, what data can trust well? Um, if you remember from Princess Bride, it was like uh, with, with Vicini, it was like, well, uh, I know a vendor told me information, <laughs> so therefore I know I can't trust that data. But if I take somebody else's data, you know, it gets very confusing. Mm -hmm. As it, what I'm saying is any single piece of data, a lot of times you know you can throw that out mm. because maybe it's good or maybe it's not, but how do I get, understand the trends, understand what's going on. Uh, we you know, love talking to the practitioners here that you know, when they're talking about their business and the impact it's had, uh, we had uh, you know, one of the customers on today was like, look, I, I deployed this and, and you know, I had like $6 million worth of savings in my business year over year. I mean, that's you know, hard information, hard to argue with it. Now, are there other solutions that might do that? Sure, but yeah, it's challenging to understand what's good data, what's not good data um, as an industry, you know, whether that's the kind of the people or uh, the, the machines themselves. I think <laughs> the other question that we're all grappling with here is, is that, and you talked about this um, earlier, just talking about the evolution of Red Hat that you've seen in, in going to the summit for all these years. This is a company founded in 1993. Um, today it is has a market cap of $15 billion, 2.4 billion in revenue, nearly 8,000 employees. Can a big company, and it's a big company now, can it innovate? Can it truly innovate? And it, we, we heard um, in the keynote, uh, one of the things that Jim Whitehurst was trying to do is to, to cultivate a startup mindset. Yeah. Is that possible? Yeah, it, it's, it's a great question, and I know, you know, Rebecca, you, you and I have been talking <laughs> about this uh, th th throughout the week so far as to, Big companies have challenges because there's the structure and the organization and what drives the business. What's interesting about Red Hat, of course, is that sure they have products, but underneath it, it's all open source. So community is, you know, in their DNA. Right. As Paul Cormier said, he's like, we couldn't buy a company and do it closed sourced again. They did that a couple of years ago. It didn't go well. They were going to transition it, but it's been a case study that's been written up. He said, if we like, were to ever buy one, it'd be me and Jim again. in the room alone. Yes. A <laughs> absolutely. So, what's interesting is Red Hat is more like a community in mm -hmm. many ways, as uh, J Jim Whitehurst's book is the open organization. So they act more like an open source community than they do a company. Of course, that being said, they're, they're profitable, they have employees, they have benefits, they have locations all around the world. Um, so it's been interesting to see how you know Red Hat adopts certain technologies, contributes to them. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see, you know, if, if we ask Jim Whitehurst tomorrow, is say, okay, well, you know, what is a product that was like, you know, developed by Red Hat versus a project that was taken in by Red Hat? Something I've seen over the last three or four years, a lot of acquisitions they made, it was, you know, let's take OpenStack for example. We would do, it, there's a big survey that's done twice a year that said, what are people using and what are they interested in with OpenStack? And it felt like that was the buying guide for Red Hat because it was like, oh, okay, here's the you know CentOS stuff was pretty interesting. Well, we can't buy Canonical, we'll buy CentOS. And that comes under the umbrella. Oh, there's this storage management piece that actually is open source that people are using for OpenStack. Well, let me buy that one too. So Red Hat has been acquisitive, but it's to get deeper engagement in the community. They're all open source. so. Always there's that balance in big companies of what do I do with R&D and what do I do with M&A? Uh, and Red Hat has done both. Uh, I, I think they've done a good job of you know, moving the industry forward. Uh, you know, innovation is you know, a lot of times it's a, a buzzword. buzzword. Yes. But um, 
they do some good stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, they contribute a lot. You know, people here are very positive uh, about what's going on. Um, just because they haven't created the next flying car um, or you know uh, things but like that. But they're on that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> we yeah. heard, we heard they're, they're absolutely. They're so. thinking about it. I mean, and I think that's also. You know, and I, I didn't mean to ask the question insinuating that they're that they're not innovating, but I do think that, particularly at a time where we are seeing um, Microsoft years of, of no growth, Intel stalled growth, um, you know, what is Red Hat's secret sauce, and also what is going to be the break, breaking point for these other lagging enterprise companies? When when will we see some some new ideas, some fresh some fresh perspectives? Yeah, uh, I I it's interesting because right, this whole the shift to what's happening with cloud, uh, you know, the the wave of the machine learning or, or you know augmented intelligence or artificial intelligence, um, how much is that going to you know ding the traditional companies, especially the infrastructure companies, um, you know, Red Hat touches it but you know they they are much broader uh their 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 growth is the, you know they're an open source company it's interesting i've seen a lot of other companies in the open source space they're like oh we're not an open source company we're an enterprise software company or a software company first um, I, I'm, I'm sure if we ask Red Hat if they were a software company, uh, they will say, well, of course, like everything we deliver is software, but at their DNA, they are open source, and that kind of sets them apart from the pack, even though there are you know, other examples, Dave Vellante went through this morning, of you know, other companies that are heavily involved in open source, right. struggling with that, how do we monetize open source? Well, so Red well, Hat is still problem, is the example. Is it a know. problem with the business model? Why is it so challenging? <laughs> um, it, it, it's a great question. You know, first time I interviewed Jim Whitehurst, it's like, Jim, why aren't there more billion dollar open source companies? Yeah. And his answer was, you know, not being flip. He's like, look, selling free is hard. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great point. But I think that we should, we, 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 need, we need to dig a little deeper yeah. and, and, and hopefully we can get to the bottom of that by, yeah, the, by and the day and three. Absolutely, and I, and I tell you, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to, you know, we'll be doing the Cloud Foundry Summit uh, in, in June there, which is, Pivotal is mm -hmm. making a lot of money with that, but uh, most of the other companies not doing as much. We were just at DockerCon a couple of weeks ago. Docker company seems to be growing, doing well. They just changed their CEO today, so hot news out at SiliconAngle.com. Uh, you know, Ben Golub, the CEO, I just interviewed him a couple of weeks ago, and now he's moving to the board, but they're bringing in the chairman of the board to okay. be CEO. So, you know, we look at all these companies. You know, Cloudera just IPO'd. Hortonworks is a public company. These companies that have open core or open source is a major piece of what they're doing. Um, you know, none have had the just measured growth and success that Red Hat does. So, you know, Red Hat as a case study, uh, it still seems to be one that kind of stands alone category by themselves, uh, but, you know, partnering and growing and, and doing great and it's exciting to cover. Day two, anything you're you're particularly excited about? Yeah, so we got a, a taste of the AWS uh, enhanced partnership, uh, talking about how OpenShift is going to have deeper integration. Uh, and we talked a little bit with Paul Carmier, so I expect Jim Whitehurst, we'll be talking to him about it. Uh, we have uh, one of the main guys involved in that from Red Hat side will be on uh, our program tomorrow. So the keynote tomorrow, I'll be watching. Uh, here maybe there'll be a special guest uh, during the keynote to t talk about that announcement some. Uh, but you know, obviously a space you know, we watch real closely. We had uh, Optum, uh, one, one of the customers on today, said, I use OpenShift and I'm using Amazon and want to do it most, and this is a game changer for me. Uh, so we think this is really interesting to watch. Really, you talked about maturity early in the segment here, the maturity of hybrid cloud. If Amazon starts to get deeper into the data centers, partnering with companies like Red Hat and like uh, you know, VMware, uh, that will help them to stave off some of the competition that's coming at them, uh, from the likes of Microsoft and Google, who's getting Kubernetes everywhere. So, um, lots more to dig in with. It's the, there's some announcements today, but a lot more to come. And you know, more customers, more partners, more Red Hatters. That's great, great. Well, we are looking forward to being back here tomorrow, uh, bright and early. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. Uh, we'll see you back here tomorrow. <laughs>